When I was in high school, I had a teacher who wanted to convince us of the importance of mathematics. In these days, everything can be computed, he said, making the following example. You have to engage, you have to hire a new person in your company. Say you have n persons waiting outside your office, and randomly you interview one person after the other, each time you have to say yes or no. If you say no, you can't go back, and if you say yes, you can no more take one off the uh, waiting list outside. You see the dilemma. If you select very early a candidate, the best one might come much later, and if you wait till the very end, the best one might have passed already a long time ago. So what is the best strategy to select the best of N candidates? Applied mathematics gives you a nice and surprising result. Namely, you select, you test the first 37%, but you reject them. Namely, n over e, e being the so-called Euler's number. And then you select the first one, which is better than the rejected ones. n over e, a nice piece of mathematics, isn't it? Impressed by it, I decided in high school to study at ETH applied mathematics, the discipline which gives such nice results. The example I presented here is commonly known as the secretary problem. But as you could easily see, it could also be called the marriage problem. <laughs> However, when I was a young student, I had to realize that the formula n over e might not really work to find a spouse. <laughs> because you don't know n in advance, <laughs> and because life is just a bit more complicated. My future wife brought me to new ideas. Anyway, applied mathematics remains an interesting discipline, and later in my function as a negotiator, I often used mathematical tools. Now, as a professor at the ETH, we try to conceptualize these experiences, and we call this conceptualization negotiation engineering. By negotiation engineering, we understand the division of a complex problem into subproblems and the application of mathematical tools in subproblems. Let's talk now about two real cases. Case number one, free movement of persons. Migration is, as we all know, a complex challenge facing society. Last year, Swiss citizens voted on a constitutional article mandating the government to regulate migration. However, this article is in contradiction with the free movement of person agreement that Switzerland concluded earlier with the European Union. While the new article foresees quotas, the EU wishes no quotas. Using negotiation engineering, we propose a model that would make it possible to preserve the principle of free movement of persons. What's the basic idea for a solution? In exceptional migration cases, exceptional measures should be possible. But what does exceptional mean? Let me make a simple example with our four neighboring countries. We take the net migration in percentage of the population, we calculate the mean value, 
and the standard deviation. And if the Swiss rate would be much higher, then a special regime would allow to bring the rate down to a predefined threshold. Now we extend the exercise to the 32 EU EFTA countries. And we check how their migration rates are distributed around the mean value. In case of a normal distribution, one could reasonably argue that the migration rate, which is higher than the mean value plus two standard deviation, you have an exceptional case. Only in these cases, temporary, limitative measures would be possible. The parameters and the modalities of the internal measures, unilateral or bilateral ones, would have to be discussed in negotiations. That's it. The take-home message of this case is mathematical methods can contribute to an objectification of a sensitive question. Now I go over to the second case, the Iranian nuclear program, a case I have been dealing with in my former life. For the past decade, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany, the so-called P5 plus one, and Iran had a dispute over the Iranian nuclear program. Why? Iran constructed centrifuges to enrich uranium, and the crucial question was whether this program is in accordance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. When the two main parties, the United States and Iran, reached the deadlock, the negotiation stopped. There was mistrust and non-constructive rhetoric. The US called for a regime change and wanted all nuclear activities to cease, while Iran was naturally against the regime change and wanted guarantees for enrichment. Switzerland, as a traditionally neutral state, promoted in 2007 a way to promote the dialogue with steps that included confidence-building measures and, of course, with a nice little mathematical model from us. The proposals laid the groundwork for the first high-level meeting in Geneva in 2008. This was the first meeting where all the seven delegation, P5 plus one and Iran, were participating. However, the key players were not ready to start the negotiation. Was our math too complicated? Probably not. Time was politically just not right to start the negotiations. And the key players went into a not very rational continuation of the confrontation. Let's now try to analyze why. We do it with game theory, whose founder was, by the way, the ETH graduate John von Neumann. The situation that prevailed can be described with the so-called prisoner's dilemma. This can be represented nicely in this matrix. You have the US on one side, Iran on the other side. Both have two strategies, being flexible, meaning willing to negotiate, or inflexible, not willing to negotiate. In the situation that existed, the payoffs were these ones. And let me now go rapidly into this matrix. Let's assume, just for a second, that both players would say, Let's be flexible. However, Iran would immediately realize that changing from flexible to inflexible, it would gain one point. So it has no incentive to stay flexible. The same logic goes for the US. 
they would have no incentive to stay flexible. Choosing both inflexible, they land in the stable strategy combination of inflexibility, which is a stable combination of strategy, and it is a so-called Nash equilibrium. As a result, both are inflexible, there are no negotiations, and we have a typical lose-lose situation. What happened now? No negotiation. One side installed more centrifuges, and the other decided on more sanctions. It started with few, and it went up this way. From 200 centrifuges to 20,000 centrifuges, from four sanctions to 80 sanctions. So both lost. Only external factors changed the game. At the outset, there were political changes from President Bush to President Obama, from President Ahmedinejad to President Rouhani. Now we leave these smiling pictures and go back to our sober matrix. Here we are again. Four other factors change the game, change the perceptions and the payoffs of the two players. Iranians started to feel the effect of sanctions and that made them a bit more flexible, in our model, of course, only. We remove one piece from right to left. The Americans, on the other hand, became concerned about the nuclear, the size of the nuclear program of Iran, and that made them, of course only here in this model, a bit more flexible. We remove one piece from the lower to the upper box. Then Iran realized that it could live the life of a regional power only with a minimum understanding with the big powers having a sort of a modus vivendi. And the Americans realized that the certain political involvement of Iran would be helpful in order to reach one day a, st a stability in the region. These changes transitioned the game from a prisoner's dilemma toward a concord game. We have with flexible, flexible combination, a stable situation. We have here the new Nash equilibrium. Flexible meaning willing to negotiate. The real negotiation could start and the result is a good one. To date, we can be satisfied. When both became flexible, a good solution was possible. I wonder, however, if they would have become flexible earlier, perhaps an even better outcome would have been possible. So the take-home message from this case is be open for negotiations. Coming back to the start of my presentation, the usefulness of mathematics. As a negotiator, I found that there is scope for mathematical tools. While they can certainly not solve all the problems of the world, of course not, they can help within certain limits to de-emotionalize the problem and to better understand the process, whether it is about finding a spouse, regulating migration, or restricting a nuclear arsenal. So, my teacher was probably not totally wrong. Math can be useful, and I would add, also in negotiations. Thank you very much.